country living, we basically identify two main reasons for country living. And this will be discussed the entire weekend. But the first reason is the crisis that we are facing at this time in Earth's history. We are facing a crisis that calls us to move to the country where others may have not been called. So that we're looking at crisis management and the things that are about to happen to this world. So that's the one reason you move into the country. But we got, it's not the only reason. The main reason is actually to develop a relationship with God. It's to come in harmony and we're going to be studying, we're going to be looking at scripture and we're going to be seeing why is this so conducive and why is there a call to country living. Let's just have a prayer before we start. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless us as we present you to you today and that your spirit may abide with us. For this is not our message, but a message that you have given to this people for this day and for this age and to prepare us for the crisis that is to come. We pray this in your name. Amen. Come out of her, my people. So why? Why must we come out of... Let's read Revelation 18, verse 2. Josh? And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So Babylon is fallen. The call is to come out of Babylon. What is Babylon? You know, when we think of Babylon, we think of a religious organization, am I right? We think of a religion, we think, in of, we think of doctrine. And the doctrine of Babylon is basically summed up in the fundamental principles are best summed up, and he shall be as God's knowing good and evil. The doctrine of Babylon is that we are good enough, we are clever enough, we are wise enough. We have the ability within ourselves, if just developed, to save ourselves. And we need no external governance. We can govern ourselves. That is the principle of Babylon. And we will see that in everything. We'll see that in Hollywood. We'll see it in, in everything that's going around us, on the media, everything. It's all about you can do it, right? I can, you can do it your way. There's many ways. So the doctrine of Babylon is about self, self-salvation apart from God. And, but is it only religion? If you think of the Italians, what do you think of? Mamma mia, Luigi. Bring us the pizza, huh? Eh? Or the pasta, right? When you think of a country, when you think of a, a government, you, you don't only have a religion, you have a way of life, am I right? Do, does Babylon have a, fi a financial system? Does Babylon have an education system? Does Babylon have a diet? Does it have a music system? Does it have an entertainment? Yes. You, Babylon has a culture. And so when we are called out of Babylon, not only are we called out of the religious error that Babylon promotes, but we are called out of the systems. And that's why the Bible says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The systems of Babylon are fallen and it is no longer safe for you and me to be in Babylon under those systems. Wherefore come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So coming out is a biblical principle. Coming out of the world is something that the Bible promotes. I know a lot of people seem to think that it's only promoted by spirit of prophecy. But this is a biblical principle right from the days of Abraham. Did Abraham come out? 
Yes, he had to come out from his people. You know, we need to ask the questions, why? Why did he have to come out? Would Noah's message have been given with power if he never built the ark? You know, he, he preached about the rain that was going to come. They had never seen rain. His message was given power by his actions. Did the ark save Noah? Not at all. The ark did not save Noah. The angels protected the ark and God's hand protected the ark from being destroyed. God saved Noah, not the ark. The ark was a work to illustrate Noah's faith. The ark never saved him. Would Noah have been saved without the ark? No, he would not have. <laughs> you see the dilemma? Our works are important, but they don't save us. And without our works, we don't illustrate our faith. So when we come to the three angels' message, can we preach the three angels' message of revelation? Come out, and we're still living in the world. Can we give power to our message? We ask the question, is our church delivering the three angels' message with power? Well, maybe it's because we can only do it once we have moved out of the world and come out and been separate. You might say to yourself, well, what if we all move out? How do the cities get warned? Country Living, page 30. Shall not the cities be warned? Yes. Not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Revelation 22, verse 11, Josh. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. We are entering the close of probation. We are entering the end of this earth's history. The time to choose who you serve is coming to an end. This is the crisis we are facing. James 4 verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know, friendship with the world is the things of this world. The luxuries, the niceties that it offers, the ease of life that it offers. It's not talking about the individual people. We need to befriend people. But we should have no friendship with the things of this world. And this is very clear in James. Luke 18 verse 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? This is Jesus. He's asking the question. When he comes, will there be faith on this earth? Why? Why is he asking this question? Does Satan have a plan? You see, this is the last opportunity. Satan knows the scriptures better than any one of us. He is more studied than any, and all of us put together, he knows the scriptures. He knows his time is short. And he has a plan. And his plan is that when Christ comes, that there will not be a single person alive ready to receive him as their king. And that's why Jesus asked the question, will there be faith when I come the second time? Because Satan is going to do everything in his power to persuade you and I that the Christ that is coming in the clouds is the false Christ. 
He's going to say he is the true Christ. How is he going to do this? Revelation 13 verse 16. And he causes, causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The temptations of Satan are greater now than ever before, for he knows that his time is short and that very soon every case will be decided, either for life or for death. In the last great conflict in the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. Desire of ages. This is what's coming before us. Now I know there's a misconception, and we have the little time of trouble, and we have the great time of trouble, and a lot of people say, well, when this time happens, God will provide. We need to be clear that there is a time, and that is right on the close of probation, and when the death penalty goes out, that you will leave whatever you have and you will flee to the mountains and you will be fed with the ravens like Elijah. But there is a time before this in which you will have to decide who you serve. And Satan is going to make it as hard as possible for you to choose to follow the true Christ as possible. Every earthly support will be removed. Do you have pensions? Do you have medical aid? Are you relying on those things? Well, when the time of no buy, no sell comes, tell me something. Has the time of no buy, no sell arrived already? Yes, thank you. Have you ever heard of sanctions? Have you heard of sanctions? Sanctions is no buy, no sell imposed on governments. Have we seen no buy, no sell recently being applied in Russia? Okay, some of those wealthy Russians, they, their accounts were frozen, etc., etc. We already have seen a time of no buy, no sell. But it's going to come down to the individual level. You will walk in and you will have 10 million rand in the bank account and you will swipe your card one day and you won't be able to pay for a loaf of bread. And I want to warn you that that time is not going to be as short as we think. If you were Satan, would you make the time of no buy, no sell short? Can you store up food for three months and go live in the mountains there and not rely on the system? Yes, it's easy. You can do that. Can you do it for a year? What if it's for three years? You've got your family. You can't pay your bond. You can't put car food in your uh, petrol in your car. You can't do anything. You cannot use a single bit of your money. Satan is going to make it very, very hard to follow God. And this is why we are called to go into the country to prepare for this period. And this preparation is to illustrate our faith. There is not one family in a hundred who will be improved physically, mentally or spiritually by residing in the city. Through the neglect of parents, the youth in our cities are corrupting their ways and polluting their souls before God. This will ever be the fruit of idleness. The almshouses, the prisons and the gallows publish the sorrowful tale of the neglected duties of parents. Better sacrifice any and every worldly consideration than to imperil the precious souls committed to your care. They will be assailed by temptations and should be taught to meet them. But it is your duty to cut off every influence, to break up every habit, to sunder every tie that keeps you from the most free, open and hearty committal of yourselves and your family to God. Again and again the Lord has instructed, 
that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts. Written in 1904. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. The Lord is coming. We are appointed to prepare the way for His coming by acting our part to prepare a people to stand in that great day. Is there one Christian whose pulse does not beat with quickened action as he anticipates the great events already opening before us. We hear the footsteps of an approaching God to punish the world for their iniquity. So we have a crisis to prepare for. Henny, uh, would you like to come forward? Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? I just want to see that the clicker, there the clicker works. Yeah, what a privilege to be here. Um, let's maybe close our eyes for prayer. Ach, dear Heavenly Father, we want to come to you and we want to pray, Lord, that you will guide us, that the Holy Spirit will view us with your truth, guide us from talking anything that's not in line with your will, and make our hearts receptive, Father, for your words. You've always guided your children, and we pray that you'll continue doing so in Jesus' name. Amen. So maybe before I start, I'm standing here in front of you. Some people know me fairly well. We were at Silverleaf. I wasn't born a Seventh-day Adventist. I was born in the Dutch Reformed Church. I grew up in a very political, active house. My father was in the Reiterwacht, the Afrikaner Bruderbond. I was involved in the Afrikaner Bruderbond. I was really active at the university in Stellenbosch. And you know what? Three times in my life, I almost died. I had an accident where I fell three stories when I was small. And I didn't even have a bruise on my body. As a young person, you don't think anything of it and you just continue with life. Years later, I had a very bad hang gliding accident. I almost died. There was actually almost no way that I could have survived. I survived unscathed. And you know what? A few years later, I had a very bad sailing accident. And I was left and I remember the day very clearly. And I was driving, I had no life jacket, nothing, and I was in the middle of the storm. I lost my kit, and, uh, and I thought, sure, so this is the way I'm going to go. It's not even a nice day, and it's a miserable day, so this is how the end is. And I was just about to go down, and something in my head said, pray. I lived a life, I was, I was living at Stellenbosch University, I studied engineering there, and I lived there for a long time. And um, I prayed, I said, Lord, pray. If you're real, if you save me today. It's going to be a miracle. I'm not going to argue with that. And uh, I'll give my life to you and I'll do your work. And you know what? Two yachts sank that day. That's how bad the storm was. They had to, my, my friends had to fight with the people with other boats to come out and search for me. They didn't want to go out. And I still believe today an angel windsurfed. Yes, young people, an angel windsurfed right to me and pulled me out. And it was something like almost two kilometers. And when we came to the shore, gone. No kick, no windsurfer, just gone. And that day I made a promise. Very soon after that promise, I forgot the promise, and I went up with my life. And you know, it's a privilege here to stand here today, because on the other side of this river is where I lived my life, at the Arte Kalfia, Hartenbos. And that's how I grew up. And you know what? As I grew up, I never met an Adventist. I didn't even know that Seventh-day Adventism existed. Nobody told me about Seventh-day Adventism. And um, I never knew the message, never knew about the Three Angels message. And then I met Anna Marie, my wife. She wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist at that stage. As I said, I haven't heard the word Seventh-day Adventist in my life. I never knew. Your doctrines. Even before we came to this camp meeting yesterday, my mom phoned me. We don't have any family that's Seventh-day Adventist. Her family is ex-Seventh-day Adventists. 
she never knew that her mom grew up Seventh-day Adventist. The mom never told her. And uh, as I packed to come here yesterday, my mom phoned me. She said, Amy, please be careful, careful of those people. Be careful of those people. That little lady, be careful. Ellen White, a lady went to hell. She saw Ellen White in hell. My dear son, be careful. I said, Mom, can you see Jesus in our lives? Yes, 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 we can see Jesus in our lives. So years ago, this is in 2004, I met my lovely wife, Anna Marie. And then she started with all these funny ideas of Seventh-day Adventism. I just said, never in my life will I be. I'm really bad. You would have clicked. It just takes a while. So we got married in 2004 and uh, wasn't interested in religion. I forgot all the promises I made. We had two lovely kids. But in God's grace, things didn't go well. In my life, things always went well. It was business. It was pleasure. It was fun. I grew up in a house where fun was everything. Surfing, skiing, anything that trickles the attention was done. Religion wasn't that important. And my firstborn was born and she had a major, major issue. She had a narrowing in her aorta and Dr. Susan Forsler had to operate on her. And it was a quite a big shock for me because things shouldn't go like that. Oops. And I started asking the question, sure, why is this happening to me? And I started looking at religion. And uh, my wife, not an Adventist at that stage, said, Henny, I know where the truth is. I said, Oh, but the truth can stay there. I'm not interested in those people. Luckily, Anka, by a miracle, got healed. We get really religious when things like this happen. She got healed. And uh, today she's fit and strong, keeping us busy. Um, but still forgot about religion. The Lord worked with us. This is not my real, you know, the interest. It's not really the testimony that I want to share with you. I want to really share the path the Lord worked with us as a family. So when these things started happening to me and things started going wrong and businesses started failing, my firstborn almost died. I start asking the questions and I turn to religion. And I remember throwing all Walter CDs out of our house in Stellenbosch and said, I never want to see you what they do, the dark sides. Not that anything to do with me. I don't want to know what the Pope's doing. He's in Rome. We live in South Africa. So, um, but the Lord worked with us and uh, we always loved the country. Sorry, I'm busy battling with this clicker. I just want to get the... Kenny, I think, I think the screen... You it's the screen. Step, step a little bit that side, yeah. Let me slip to this side. Let's just see. Oh, that's working perfectly. So for some reason, our kids love milking cows. So we took them <laughs> and... Uh, the kids love animals and they still love animals. So as good parents, we started reforming. And in 2008, I was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And, you know, I could tell my mom proudly yesterday, mom, I'm not afraid of those people. Mom, I am those people. Praise God. And those people have got a message and it's called the three angels message. And We've committed our life as a family to proclaim that message because nobody told me about that message. You know, sometimes as Adventists, and I'm calling myself a Seventh day Adventist, you know, we see the other people as the enemies. You know, the Dutch Reformed Church, the Pentecostals, you know, they do these things and these things. I was there. Nobody told me that there was another way of living. So when we came, became a Seventh day Adventist, I mean, we grabbed onto the health message, we grabbed onto country living. It was nearly impossible because at that stage, the Lord took everything away from us. I hardly had a job. All the money was gone. But by God's grace, we continued. We loved camping. I don't know how many of you know Gerald and Sabrina Kritzer. That's their children many, many years ago. So uh, we started on a journey looking for country properties. And I can tell you, it was one of the hardest journeys we've been on. And one of the most difficult ones, because we had no reference point. There wasn't really many Adventists doing it, uh, surprisingly. So then me and Anna Marie say, listen, let's start on this journey. Let's go look for something in the country. It's expensive. It's one of the most difficult things to do, because you get to the properties, you don't know what to do, you don't know what to expect, you don't know what you need. Uh, there's so many things surrounding a country property, water rights, etc., etc. You, you as a city do I don't know nothing about it. But we started on the journey and uh, 
We didn't have any preconceived ideas. The kids obviously loved it. They tagged along and everywhere there was animals. And uh, I know that pig is unclean, but it was really, really cute. And uh, it caught Anka's attention like you won't believe. So uh, cats and dogs filled up the house. And there we had a Libyan with a little springbok visiting us. And by the way, there's some dinosaur footprints in Namibia. So the kids started horse riding and we thought, you know what? If we can't get into the country, let's just at least get the kids into an environment. So they started horse riding, but at some stage, the God, God convicted us. You know, what is the definition of country living? Um, and this is just our testimony. We came to the realization that we need to be at a place where we're not dependent on the system to supply our needs. Otherwise, we won't be able to do the work. We're going to be pretty much in the same predicament as the rest. It's going to be difficult to help the people around us if we can't help ourselves. So we started looking. As I said, it was really, really difficult. In Somerset West, battling with the two thoughts, Somerset West is the country. And we came to the realization Somerset West is not the country. Because if I don't pay my water bills, there's no water. If I don't pay my electricity, there's no electricity. Uh, if spa closes down, my family is not going to eat if buy and sell hits. So we realized we need to get out. And even if we have a little veggie garden to soothe our conscience, it's not good enough. We need to be at a place where we can properly look after our family. And this is typically what you find. It's expensive. It really breaks your your motivation and then there's nice ones these not so nice ones and it's a real journey that you end up being on this is by the way jock and monique this is your farm we looked at and uh and then the lord brought us to this little place in the Karoo. it's against the swartberg mountains it's under the Cook and lady smith and it was just a piece of land so the Lord works with each family different. He knows exactly where he needs to mold and modify our characters. So the Lord took this piece of land and he started molding and modifying our characters. Interesting enough, Anka sat down and she said, Lord, if this is our farm, please give us a fossil. And she went into the little ravine, cracked open the stone, and there it was, a little fossil of a shell. And uh, we prayed and said, Lord, this is our spot. We're buying it. And then we bought the property. This is the week there often. And that's our backyard. It's the little Swartberg Mountains. And there's the cliff where we get all our water from. And uh, the property didn't have anything on it. It was really, really, uh, let's call it derelict. There was no house with nothing. And uh, this was our harvest of the portraits that remained. We called in the team to come and clean up. So the kids learned to work with wheat eaters and all of those type of things. And we started cleaning up. We had a bit of fun in the process as well. And that's pretty much a section of the land. So it's derelict, there's not much there. So we started. And again, these are practical things. And, and country living is practical. And that's what makes it so amazing. It's preparing for what's coming. But the Lord works with us. And it's actually a lot of fun. It's disheartening, it's joyful, it's passionate, etc., etc. So we started building the dam. We were really excited when we started pushing the roads. And this is the first water that started flowing from the cliff, 1.4 kilometers away, into our dam. So this was a big day for us. And uh, that's just the top view of the dam being built with the orchards below it. We were so excited about the steps. The neighbors thought we were stark raving mad, camping in the middle of nowhere with two kids. They actually came to us and asked us whether we were all right. So um, this was one of our first projects, installing the pipe. The kids were involved. It was a big family event where we had to divert the water from the river into the pipe. And uh, Anna Marie was there. The kids were there. And there we were still very optimistic that it's going to be a quick job, like you do it in the city. I think that's Anna Marie laughing at me when I gave her the timeline when the job will be done. So we started. And uh, Anna Marie gave food for the guys. We worked through the night. The kids were there. It was like action stations all the time. It took much longer than we anticipated. That's, that's how it was. And that was the end product. And it was such a feat for our little family because now we can get the water to our dam and to four other neighboring farms. 
the kids started taking a keen interest in uh, in gardening and um, yeah and maybe talking a little bit about the disappointments this is our dam with the first water in it um, and this is how you look when the farmer comes to you or your farm worker comes to you and he says Meneer het dam lek alweer. So for four times we had to rebuild the dam. At the end we fixed the dam. It was an absolute mission and here we started building the house on top of a hill, the most obscure place, but that's where Anneli really wanted it. So all the water needs to be pumped up, but we've got amazing views. We work like busy bees. Everything we could because there's a budget. Uh, we literally, we literally sold, the, sold our property in Somerset West. We rented a house, we put everything we had into this project and we saved money everywhere we could. And uh, we really, really felt the calling. Then we started building the garage, uh, very proud, <laughs> but uh, we didn't know what was coming. There we were building on the top story of the garage. That previous winter, the gables blew off. We had 105 kilometer hour wind. So we lost a lot of equipment and stuff in the process. But um, slowly the family project started progressing and life happened. Kids breaking their arms on horses and stuff also happened while we were building the farm. But um, stable doors got in. And then I went to Europe for business. And uh, this is in the Netherlands at the Parliament. And that, it was in 2019. I jumped on the plane and I flew back. And I bought this magazine. And uh, when I came back, I said to him, really look at this weird cover page. Isn't it funny? I mean, why would they do that? And what was interesting, I took the magazine and I said to her, something is funny, you know, they were predicting the world in 2019. And I mean, on the left side, you could see Putin's pipelines. Interesting. I thought that was an accident or something that happened recently. But in 2019, there's Pinocchio, a lot of lies. There's a bird bringing children, barcoded. There's digital IDs. There's something going on with the DNA of people. There's cannabis. And then, interesting enough, I picked that up. South Africa's election box is there as well. And then the four horse riders of the apocalypse, the Statue of Liberty had a mask on it. Interesting. Way before we had masks in the COVID pandemic. In any event, when COVID hit, I think it was a Thursday, Two days before that, when Ramaphosa started talking, and Marie said, you know what, we're not going to stay here. It's not going to happen. We're going to go. I said, go where? We have no house. We have nothing. She said, find the neighbor and rent his house. So we found our neighbors. They were in Australia. They said, happy days. You can rent our house. So in a blitz, we packed up. And you'll see that the cat, Caterby, was the thing that got the most attention because the cat needs to go everywhere. So we literally packed up. Locked our house in Somerset West, and we moved to Lady Smith. We lived there, and I can tell you, during, pan during the pandemic, we were not harassed. We had no issues. We swam, we ran, we hiked in the mountains. We don't even know that there was a pandemic. Um, and we were starting, actually, the one time we were building, starting our house in lockdown five. We were building, and the police stopped there. And I thought, okay, this is now not all. We were building like busy bees. The guy said, listen, you see this and this person. I said, yes, you just go there. Thank you, sir. They left. And it just exemplified things will come to the country as well. There will be trouble as well. It's just much less intense. So the kids enjoyed themselves. Schoolwork obviously got on the back burner. But uh, they caught up quickly. We started finishing the house. And again, that's the fourth time the dam was uh, leaking. So we lined the dam. The dam is not leaking anymore, <laughs> but it was a mission. So we really appreciate that dam currently. And when the fences went around the little property, it stopped becoming home to us. So we pulled some more furniture. I mean, I'm not proud of the way of our moves looked. It really looked like something out of this world, but you know what? We were so motivated to, to get things going. And then the little place started becoming home. And we had a birthday there. And we started settling there and uh, there the kids brought back to a birthday cake and at that stage it was really just a garage with a toilet it wasn't really a house and then we started expanding doing the um, flower boxes and everybody was jumping in it was such 
a mission for the family. Everybody was aligned. It was a family mission to establish ourselves there. And uh, we all jumped in. The kids jumped in. We established our first orchard. And uh, sorry, that's out of focus, unfortunately. And what we realized, we know nothing about farming once the orchard was established. That is my rocket science grapevine planting machine. We, uh, we found out that that works the best and we had a bunch of people and everybody was just planting vines at that stage. The kids got involved in the community. So this was a Christmas, Christmas carols evening, believe it or not, at very, very staunch Roman Catholic neighbors. And uh, the Lord's blessed us. And I'll tell you a short story how the Lord blessed us dealing with them. And uh, yeah, that's our swimming pool. And then the house got finished by God's grace. We finished the house. And as you would know with these things, it's never finished. So there's always cupboards that are not 100% finished, etc. But that's my wife in a food forest where she's planting and uh, slaving away. The orchards started to produce. And we were blessed for the first time. I ate grapes that we grew ourselves. That's red cloves. And uh, we were actually shocked when we saw vines actually produce grapes. It doesn't come from a shop. It actually comes. So we packed our grapes. We sold our grapes. The kids started getting their own little business because industry is part of it. If we're going to live and survive in the next economy, which we believe is an industrial economy, so it's not so much the money you have in the bank as the deals you are doing on ground group level. So uh, they started producing. They did very well. This was a youth market in Ladysmith. And uh, God's really blessed us. This is a Sabbath afternoon being in nature. And uh, as I say, there, there could be a lot of excuses and arguments not to do this. It's been a very difficult journey, but it's been such a blessing. And I think, Anka, we would do this all over again because rabbits, deer, buck, um, roipat, leopard, baboon, all of them become part of your life. They become part of the trouble and they become part of the solution. So recently the kids got their horses. So the kids don't clean their rooms, but they love picking up horse dung. I don't figure that out. So somehow we thought, let's put horse dung in their rooms. But, uh, and uh, then for those men out there, don't let anyone tell you a farm is too small for a tractor. Every farm has to have a little tractor. So we bought this little thing, caused us a lot of trouble. But uh, yeah, and the kids, this is their product. So some of these products you'll see at the back as well that uh, the kids produce. We now soap as well. And the kids are actually doing fairly well uh, with the products they're selling on, uh, I think soon they've been selling on, what's that? Take a lot. And uh, this is me and Anna Marie, and this is maybe the realities of country living. So everything seems peachy and it seems nice. This is me and Anna Marie in Barrydale. She's heading to the farm and I'm heading to Somerset West. And that's sometimes the realities of these things. It's not easy. You know, many people I've spoken to it's a sacrifice. We could have easily bought a house in Somerset West, put the children in school, and just lived a happy, simple life. But we chose this journey because the Lord impressed it on our hearts. And uh, still, and Marie works for the University of Stellenbosch, where still she's traveling. I'm traveling. We have a business in Somerset West. Um, it's hard work. It's sacrifices. It's, uh, it's a challenge. But... God's blessed us with the opportunities to live and learn in a country. This is typically the hardships you could experience. The water doesn't come from a municipality. It comes from our pipe and our pipe burst. And our pipe didn't produce water for us. And we didn't have water for quite a while. And we need to fix our pipe. Otherwise, there's no water on our farm. So uh, with all those challenges, floods, this is me and my wife. It's not a very nice picture, but we really knocked out, we didn't pose, uh, on stretchers. So for one year, we lived on stretchers. Uh, we didn't sleep on a bed, um, and we just worked ourselves to bed. This is the old age home in Lady Smith, where the kids are ministering with a little church uh, in Lady Smith, blessing the old people with, um, yeah, with, the, uh, with their ministry. Um, so in summary, this is really just a short overview of our story. We didn't grow up Adventists. We have zero 
support for being Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, we have a lot of opposition in our families. Um, and when we made this move, we didn't only have a lot of opposition from our family, we actually had a huge amount of opposition from fellow Seventh-day Adventists, which for me was odd. I never grew up with a message. I didn't grow up with a Seventh-day Adventist message, the Three Angels message. I didn't grow up with a health message. I didn't grow up with a country living message. And it's for me difficult to understand why, why this has not been much bigger in the church, why there's not special departments advocating this, helping people with this, supporting people with this. Um, I lived my whole life on the other side. It's a dark side. It's a lonely side. There's no hope. What about this and that? Oh, my son, just believe. You'll never understand it. That's how I grew up. You never understood the Bible. So um, it's my prayer in sharing a few photos with you and, uh, and our testimony. This church is really God's end time church. You're the Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a new one. I'm telling you, this is God's last day movement. He's given you all the knowledge. And um, we have the immense privilege of sharing this with the world around us. And I like saying this, and some of my Adventist friends don't like it when I do it, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not normal Christians. They are God's special forces. And if you've got God's special forces, God's special forces needs to prepare for a very special time that's coming. A dangerous time, but also a glorious time. May God bless you on your journey as well. And again, we're not the chosen frozen. We are normal people battling through the knowledge and the information that God's given us. You know, what's, inter what's interesting is if you study the history of the Adventist church, during the nuclear crisis, just after World War II, the church, the GC, had departments that were specially uh, designed for country living. You can go back, you can see that every church had a country living, like you would have a marriage or a family ministries, you would have a social ministries, you would have a country living department in every church. That was GC, all the way down to the bottom. And that was during the missile crisis and, and the, the nuclear crisis. So it was there, but we've, we've forgotten about it, you know. Yeah, and I think from, from, from that perspective, so at um, Alderberg College, Alderberg High School, we've started a program called Nature's Pantry. It's a humble, small project, but it's really just to let a small light where people can go and start connecting with the whole country living resource and supporting people in getting out into the country. But we'll get into those details, those practical challenges. You know, the good news is, People have done it, learned the lessons. Everybody doesn't need to learn the lessons over and over. And uh, I think Clayton, Henny, and myself and our families will all agree that it's probably going to be the hardest thing you will ever do moving into the country. And this is why we're yeah, here, because we've had to learn. We've made lots of mistakes, and we want to encourage you, but we want to be here for you. If you're interested, come to us, um, mingle with us, ask questions, and we, we, we don't want you to waste God's money. When you make a mess up, you're wasting God's money. If you could have got advice, that money could have gone to something else. So we, we don't want to see those. We've all, we've all got, wasted lots of money, am I right? And so come to us and... The reason, it's not God's fault that country living is difficult. You know that? Did you see when those quotes, some of those quotes I read, when were they published? 1904, 1898. It's our parents that have made it hard. Just think of Israel. Was Israel's journey into the promised land supposed to be difficult? Eh? Would have cleared the land. They would have sorted out. They would have been in there within months. Why did they end 40 years in the wilderness? Disobedience. Disobedience and the parents. The reason it is so hard for us today is because our parents should have done it in a time 
when it was natural and easy, am I right? But it doesn't mean we can't do it, eh? I think that's, that's for today, eh? Yeah. And don't get discouraged. God doesn't need your money. God uses. He uses what you've got. We've seen miracles with people who had absolutely no means to make it work. But as soon as you obey. You're talking about us. God opens the door. Us as well. God opens the door. If we walk in line with God's will and direction for our lives, he opens the door. But the doors will not open before you walk. You first need to walk in faith, and then the doors open up slowly as you walk forward. Absolutely. Okay, we'll close in prayer. Henny, would you like to close? Please? I can. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Father, we know this is a contentious issue but it's not really a contentious issue you are calling us to give up that which babylon promises us to make us happy we want to pray that you'll be with every single individual and family here as they maybe start or continue the journey with you on this route we know father that you long father to do miracles for us every single day you long to commune with us and spend time with us so we want to pray that you'll Bless each and every family and that you'll bless us and that you'll bless this camp meeting so that we, with a renewed Father's fire in our heart, go out to do your will and be part of your special forces to go out into this world and distribute your love and good news to the people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this afternoon we will cover attempting and fulfilling the impossible. That will be the one talk. And Clayton and Melinda Zeely, they will be sharing their family story. We'll have a slot on, uh, on homeschooling. And what's fascinating is we are very different families, different backgrounds. And so each family's story is going to be very different. Thank you. God bless. Thank you for attending.